Affirmative action. Diversity policies. Race conscious admissions. For many of us entering the brutally competitive world of college admissions or job applications, these controversial terms may be nothing new. These policies all seek to address the critical question. How do we create inclusive, equitable opportunities for everyone in society? And while most would agree this question is an important one, we often disagree on how to answer it. For any diversity, equity, and inclusion policy, there's always more than what first meets the eye. And in this episode of To The Max, we will explore the psychology of what lies beneath. How did these policies evolve? How can we evaluate them? Who are the people behind them? And perhaps most importantly, what do these policies really mean for the future of institutions and society at large? Hard questions to answer, but I think I know the perfect person who can help us try. This is To The Max, advice from today's experts to tomorrow's leaders. He said to me very explicitly, do you want to take this risk? I was like, okay, so you just said that one thing is easier and the other one is more risky and harder, but also like way more interesting and awesome. Like sign me up for that one. This is Dr. Rosalind Chow, a graduate of Columbia and Stanford universities. She is now a professor of organizational behavior and theory at Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business. She is also the faculty director of the Executive Leadership Academy a program designed to prepare Black leaders for executive advancement in business and society. As one of the world's leading experts in DEI in the workplace and education, her work spans the realms of behavioral research and consulting. Today, Dr. Chow will share with us not only her expertise in the psychology of policymaking, but also how young people can become the best leaders of a diverse, equitable, and inclusive future. Um, how we describe inequality really changes our perception of how we react to it, which I thought was really cool. Um, I was wondering, can you talk about what, first, what are inequality frames, and also how does this affect people's willingness to fight injustice? So the question is, how would our understanding of inequality change if we started really focusing not just on the group that is, is suffering, but also in a group that is really, in a way, benefiting from a lot of how society is structured. It all depends on whether or not you think those differences are legitimate. If you say, you know, my team won, you have a different understanding of that than if you say the other team lost. If my team won, it's because my team, like, is awesome. And if that their team lost, it's because their team sucked. If, it, if they see it as a legitimate um, inequality or, or, or difference, um, they're gonna like being part of the group that is on top. So legitimacy is a big part of it. When you start talking about illegitimate inequalities is when you see those things switch. So let's say like in this example, your team cheated. One is they're not even gonna wanna talk about how their team won. So the other part of it could be, yeah, you know, like the school's team won. I'm not gonna talk about it as we won anymore. You wanna pay attention to that. Right. How are people talking about these, these types of differences? Yeah, and actually to go off of that, I know that you and your co-authors recently came out with an article in Slow Management Review about this model you came up with, deny, disidentify, distort, and dismantle with how groups react to inequality. And I was wondering if you could talk about what this model is and also how does this help us understand how groups relate to inequality? So when people say, like, stop talking about people as belonging to specific social categories, we're all just human beings. That's denying the experience that other people have. They actually do have to live a life where other people put them in these social categories. But it's also the denial that racism is a problem or even exists. And so you see this sometimes with claims of re reverse discrimination. So for students, often you'll see this expressed as when they see a student of color in their class, they might either explicitly or implicitly think, well, that person probably like isn't as qualified because they got in because of affirmative action. Disidentify is this gut response of, okay, I'm willing to acknowledge that certain people get benefits because of who they are, 
But what I'm now going to do is find ways to think of myself so that I am not a member of that group. Distortion is this other one that we've been finding more and more, which is basically depending on how you define diversity, that's going to impact you know how you think about your diversity, equity, and inclusion practices. If you are saying like the only thing we care about is diversity of thought, then that means that a lot of tactics that are open to you that are really targeted for race are like no longer seem appropriate. And then dismantle is when you're like, okay. There's a problem. I'm a part of this problem. When we start talking about allyship, sponsorship, um, and confronting people who engage in prejudice behavior, that's what we're talking about. We're gonna talk about dismantling. Yeah, and I think this gets to another super interesting aspect of your research, which is the actual people behind these policies. I know you talk a bit about cognitive policies and affirmative action and how support for these doesn't actually create the equality that they initially appear to promote. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about your research and what you found, and also how this relates to your model of the 40s you were just talking about. Colorblindness as an ideology is, is functionally a form of denial. It's saying race shouldn't matter, everybody should be treated the same, but if there are pre-existing inequalities, then treating everyone the same just means that the inequality persists and stays. And so that's why you see people arguing that like, it's not about equality that we need right now, it's about equity so that we can bring everybody to the same place. And if we are able to get people to that same place at some point, then yes, we should absolutely like go with colorblind ideology. Um, or colorblindness, but like until we get to that point, really what you're trying to say is you just don't want us to talk about things that make you feel uncomfortable. Research that I have done for affirmative action, what we have found is that you can support affirmative action policies because one, you truly believe that society has a problem and that the best way to deal with it is affirmative action policies. Um, but there's also another group of white Americans that we were able to identify who basically want to support affirmative action policies because they think that if they do, that'll make, that'll make it so that all this conversation about the structural stuff is going to go away. None of this is conscious, by the way. Most people don't explicitly or consciously think like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna support affirmative action policy because I just want this problem to go away. What are things that we can do as teachers and as young people to move towards the future of dismantling inequality and uplifting each other as the leaders of tomorrow? People say, hey, you know, diversity is good for team performance or for companies um, because they presume that if diversity exists, it gets expressed, but that's not actually true. Oftentimes, if there is diversity on a team, usually the members of marginalized groups stay quiet about how different they are from everyone else because they don't want to be excluded. But then it means that they're not sharing these diverse perspectives that the group actually needs in order to perform better. If people aren't engaging with each other that draws out their difference, then we don't get the benefit of having all those diverse perspectives. So what these researchers are starting to find is that it's not just how students think about their own mindset that seems to matter, but also how what their teachers believe about mindset matters. The reason I bring this up is because we're finding that it is even more important in contexts where stereotypes exist. So for example, in STEM, where usually you have stereotypes that work against women and minorities, having faculty or teachers who have this malleable mindset actually helps to buffer some of that negative effect of those stereotypes and it, it can make those students actually perform better. If we can let go of that bias and be more open and assume that other people have value to bring, that will just lead to a very different mindset to how you engage with other people. Now, granted, we all have, again, limited capacity. So I, I get like, you're not gonna be able to have that kind of deep conversation with everyone. Um, but even if you were willing to expand it just a little bit, I think that could have a, a really big difference. Here are six things we can take away from Dr. Chow's advice. How people describe inequality is often a clue about their attitudes towards it. Learn to recognize the systemic origins of inequality. Consider intention and impact when evaluating DEI policies. Diverse representation isn't enough. 
you have to make sure everyone has a voice to bring their perspectives to the table. Leaders with growth mindsets can create inclusive communities. Consciously recognize and let go of our biases. Thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed it and discovered something you can apply in your own life. If you liked what you saw, please like and subscribe. And if you're interested in learning more, the full interview is linked in the description below. See y'all next time!